So you'll see from my handout that the title has slightly changed. I was going to talk about Bernard's response to both Gilbert of Poitiers, uh, Gilbert de la Porée, and Peter Abelard. Uh, I, I didn't, in the end, manage to include Peter Abelard. I had sufficient material from Gilbert, so I'm just going to focus on that. And I think it turns out uh, you get a very clear sense, even from looking at what Bernard de Clairvaux says about Gilbert, um, of, of what his own interests, capabilities, and limitations were. So this is now the role of philosophy in Bernard of Clairvaux's attacks on the Trinitarian theology of Gilbert of Poitiers. So I'm going to start with three questions. What in the 12th century was philosophy? Number one. Number two, what was it to be a philosopher? And number three, what was it to philosophize? Well, on the first question, what philosophy was varied from author to author, depending on antecedent views about the division of the sciences. For Huss and Victor, for example, philosophy is synonymous with science. It's the most general category in the taxonomy of the disciplines, of which all others are subdivisions. And philosophy is first divided into theoretical, practical, mechanical, and logical. Theoretical is divided into theology, mathematics, identified as a quadrivium, and physics, which follows Boethius and, and Aristotle. Logic is divided into grammar, one part of the trivium, and argument, and argument into demonstration, probable argument, and sophistical argument. And of these, probable argument is divided into dialectic and rhetoric, the other two parts of the trivium. We find something similar in William of Conch. Um, Quote, philosophy is the true contemplation of those things that are and that are not seen, and of those things, are, are, uh, th of those things that are and that are seen. So it's a universal category. We find something very different in Gilbert of Poitiers. Gilbert divides the sciences into theoretical and practical, and theoretical science into natural sciences, ethics, and logic. And natural sciences are in turn divided, following Boethius, into theology, mathematics and physics. Philosophy is just mathematics and physics of those three. And it's distinguished from theology by its object. The object of philosophy is the material world and the object of theology the immaterial world. And the evidence I have for all this isn't mine, but it comes from Lauga Nielsen, who has read a text of Gilbert that I've not read uh, because I don't have ready access to the manuscript, which is a commentary on uh, Romans. That's one question. What was philosophy? It might just be a very small subdivision of the sciences. It might or may not include theology. Or it might be the whole lot. Another question, then. What was it to be a philosopher? And the third question, what was it to philosophize? They don't track this kind of division at all. What it was to be a philosopher was, among other things, to be dead, at least for the most part. St. Bernard, for example, gives us just two thinkers who he counts as philosophers. Uh, no, this is false, sorry, three thinkers, Plato, Aristotle, Boethius. Hewis and Victor lists as philosophers Parmenides, Socrates, Plato, Pythagoras, Democrates, Xenocrates, and Zeno and also patristic theologians with evident knowledge of pagan philosophy could count as philosophers too. Uh, according to John of Salisbury, Origen was the sharpest, quote, sharpest and most learned Christian philosopher, and according to Abelard, the greatest philosopher of the Christians. Abelard calls Pseudo Dionysius the Areopagite a great philosopher. And Hugh, well, something similar, Dionysius according to Hugh, changed from a philosopher to a Christian theologian. But there are some exceptions to the dead rule. Peter Avalard, for example, calls himself a philosopher. Um, Thomas of Marigny, one of Bernard of Clairvaux's associates, um, likewise calls him a philosopher. And there are some others. William of Conch is labelled with either irony or scorn, a philosopher by another of Bernard's associates, William of Saint-Thierry. Gilbert of Poitiers, sometimes referred to admiringly as a philosopher by his followers. Everard of Ypres, for example, talks of 
quote our very great philosopher, I mean the Bishop of Poitiers, and the author of the Compendium Logicae Puritanum, preserved in an Oxford manuscript, three times talks about our philosopher, obviously referring to Gilbert because it's a compendium of Puritan logic. Gilbert himself has a very nuanced view of the relation between philosophy, understood as physics and mathematics, and theology, and sometimes even takes on the role of the philosopher as such in theological discussion. So he has two, he has two key positions, I think. The first uh, is that philosophical technique, whatever that is, can help in clarifying and even deciding difficult theological questions. The second is that philosophical positions can themselves contribute to the substance of theological discussion, either by being analogous to theological cases or by being such that philosophy and theology simply share certain key claims. So here is the first claim that philosophical, philosophical technique can help in theology. Um, and I think this is on your handout. Um, Gilbert's Latin is, it's hard to find the right word for it, maybe crunchy. It's very hard to make it come out in an elegant way. Uh, so you'll have to put up with that, I'm afraid. In, it was it's perfectly good Latin. In those matters in which conflict obscures our understanding of many arguments, as it seems, they, the philosophers, disprove by many demonstrations the false side of the questions and confirm the true. And in those matters in which the other side of the question, having rested on a few baseless reasons, gives way, they do not work much to show its falsity and the truth of the other. So the philosophers are doing two things there. Uh, they're sorting out difficult, knotty dialectical problems. Um, and they're showing you when you've just got a really bad argument, you can destroy it very quickly. And it's their dialectical skill that's the crucial thing. The philosophers, not the theologians, Gilbert's word is philosophy, okay, he's talking about philosophers. It's they and not the theologians who can discern good arguments from bad and plausible ones from implausible ones. And they are the ones capable of demonstration, that is to say, of dialectic. The same point is made in the context of a, of the, of a discussion of the theological errors of Nestorius and Eutyches. These two thinkers oppose, quote, the Catholic faith and philosophical reasons that depend on the foundation of the Christian faith about the unity of person and the diversity of natures in Christ. So they weren't good philosophers. Um, so I don't think Gilbert in these passages is, is modifying his account of the domain of philosophy as, so that it includes logic as well. I take his point to be contingent. As a matter of fact, those trained in natural philosophy and mathematics are also better trained in dialectic but I'm not sure about the interpretation there. Um, Gilbert makes his second point about the, sub the substantive contribution of philosophy to theology by noting, well, first of all, that there's an overlap between philosophy and theology. Here's what he says, it's on the handout, I think, but we wish to understand all these things merely about created things. In theological matters, what follows, it's the beginning of a chapter of a treatise, will teach us that some things are similar between philosophy and theology, and others dissimilar. For we don't think that either all of the things or none of the things that are understood in natural or mathematical sciences should be accepted in theological science. Therefore, with the most precise and disciplined philosophy, we should observe the reasons common to, common to each and proper to them individually. Right, and so this, uh, this commonality works out in two ways. In this passage, theology and philosophy are represented as simply sharing certain key rationes, claims or arguments. Uh, but the common claims can also be related to each other, secondly, by some kind of analogy. And here Gilbert calls this proportion. Their descendants, that is, I think, the descendants of the scriptural authors, having spoken differently but with the same sense, clarified the obscure meanings of those puzzling statements, that's the Bible, with learned interpretations and supported them not only by their authority but also by reasons. Either the majesty of theology vindicates the reasons as proper to theology or some sort of proportion of human philosophy to theology admits these reasons as common to philosophy and theology both. So Gilbert's view on this contrasts very nicely with that of the monastic theologians. So William of Saint-Thierry, 
who was, who was really Bernard's general henchman in doing his uh, not dirty work, uh, holds that philosophy uh, comprises, so this is the domain of philosophy, comprises the complete study of the material order, and as such, provided it's not undertaken for the sake of curiosity, unobjectionable. And he includes natural theology too, but this turns out to be only following the theme of, of Paul in the first chapter of Romans. Um, we can demonstrate the existence of God only so that we can be held accountable for our sins. So it's, it's as he says, when philosophy exalts itself to divine matters, the higher it ascends, the lower it falls. Um, and then he, in, he says this a few times, and then he immediately goes on to quote uh, the text from St. Paul where he says, we can show that God exists, but this condemns us, renders us inexcusable for sin. But, and this is quite important, philosophy has no application to reveal theology, according to William. At the root of the errors of William of Conche, as William of saint he sees it, is that, uh, quote, he is in a base sense a man who is a natural philosopher, right? Physicus et philosophus, who philosophizes about God physically. And we get and Thomas of Morigny, another associate of Bernard's, says the same thing about Abelard. He wrote about things which pertain to God, not so much in a Catholic way as philosophically, right? Non tam catholicae quam philosophicae. Um, <clears throat> And William of saint says some very hostile things about dialectic, too. Um, he talks about the biblical teaching as uh, simple, the simple and milk-white Christian and, and, and apostolic teaching, and that solves all the arguments of the dialecticians. And Christ, another quote, Christ sent very few, that is to say 12, fishermen to the sea of the world with the nets of faith, uneducated in the liberal disciplines and utterly unpolished in relation to the teachings of the world, not experts in grammar or armed with dialectic. So there's exactly the opposite of Gilbert. The Bible is, is, is confused and needs explicating by dialectic. Here, in, uh, in William of saint the Bible is transparent and God chose people who didn't need or use dialectic. It just, yeah. It's, uh, the contrast is very clear. William of saint writes a very interesting uh, treatise, De Natura Corporis et, et, et Anime, right, on the nature of the body and the soul. And he divides the discussion into two discrete parts. The treatment of the body, for which he relies solely on philosophy and physics, and the treatment of the soul, for which he relies solely on the ecclesiastical doctors. So there's a rigid division between the two domains. So now I'll go back to Gilbert. Um, the text that I'm mainly looking at, well, the text that I'm entirely looking at, is um, a set of commentaries on Boethius's five theological treatises. Um, Boethius, uh, Gilbert categorizes Boethius as one of the philosophers. So he's already put his cards on the table. William of saint is a good contrast. He relies on Boethius as an authority in the theological part of his treatise on the soul, and thus counts him not as a philosopher, but as an ecclesiastical doctor. Um, Bernard, as I mentioned before, I categorizes Boethius as a philosopher, but that's by the by. Um, in an important passage, Gilbert contrasts different views on the second of Boethius's axioms in the De Hebdomadibus. The axiom is diversum est esse it id quod est. So being and that which is are diverse. We've got two different ways of interpreting this according to Gilbert. One, according to the theologians. In this case, quote, esse, right, being, is understood to be that which is the principle and id quod est, that which is from the principle. Right, that's one translation. Another philosophical translation, right, according to some philosophers, um, Boethius himself, I think, essay belongs to those substances which alone are predicated of subsisting things, whereas those things which are are merely the things that subsist by having these things predicated of them. Right? That's a mouthful. It's very simple, in fact. Theologians understand essay to be God, and that which is to refer to the things that derive from God, that is to say, creatures. Philosophers understand essay in a very technical, 
sense Sir Gilbert has, he gets from Boethius, essay is a thing's subsistence, the fact that it, it exists or something, or, and id quod est is the thing itself. Um, right, so the basic view in, in, in Gilbert, there's a distinction between an id quod, a subsisting thing, and an id quo, the subsistence or form in virtue of which a thing subsists and is of such and such a kind. So we've got two different understandings of this um, axiom from Boethius. Um, and Gilbert notes that you know, the theologians and the philosophers can agree that the formulation is true while they mean radically different things by the statement. And so, quote, in this way, therefore, both according to theology and according to the philosophers, it can rightly be said that, and then he quotes the axiom, diversum est esse et id quod est. So here's, what, here's an odd thing. Boethius, go, uh, I'm sorry, Gilbert goes on to um, discuss, to give a commentary of the rest of um, Boethius' axioms. And he never again uses the theological understanding, even when he gets to axiom seven, which is an axiom, a famous axiom about God. What he does instead, he adopts wholesale the philosophical understanding of the aphorism, uh, and then shows just how it does and does not apply in the divine case. So in the discussion of the second axiom, he says, follows, what, quote, what follows will teach us how this rule and the others, other than the seventh which follow, should be taken, both in the use of the theologians and the other philosophers. That's on the second axiom. He doesn't do that uh, when he gets to the seventh axiom, which is about God. Uh, he applies, he uses his philosophical understanding to interpret the axiom. The axiom is this. Every simple thing has one essay and id quod est. Right? That's Boethius. What does Gilbert do? First of all, he says that this one can be exemplified solely in the theological domain, right? in theologicis. But secondly, the commentary on the seventh axiom makes no use of the theological interpretation of the second axiom. Uh, it represents entirely an application of the philosophical interpretation of the second axiom to the question of God. And the theological interpretation of the second axiom drops out. So what happens? Gilbert understands the seventh axiom to mean that God has both essay and id quod est, but that these are the same as each other. So he claims that we can truly assert, by analogy with the created order, that there is God, an essence by which he is, and also that God is the essence itself. And Gilbert goes on to note that God's utter simplicity means that the power by which he's powerful and the wisdom by which he is wise are not in any way distinct from the essence, and that God is whatever he is. So what we've got is we've got an application of the, of the, of the philosophical interpretation of the second axiom about the distinction between esse and id quod est as a distinction in effect between a thing and that in virtue of which it subsists. Uh, and Gilbert, without denying the distinction, identifies these two things in God. So if we think that you know, the subsistence of a thing provides some kind of grounding for its existence, God will be a self-grounder. That's his thought. I talked above about an analogy with the created order. What Gilbert says in the discussion of the seventh axiom is we transume, right, transumimus, the words from natural things to God. And so transumption, it's not just transferring the word from one domain to the other, but it's using the words in, in some kind of new sense in a theological context. So here, when we're getting the essay id quod est, uh, id quo est distinction, um, I think we're not saying we're using our words in a new sense, but we're finding a case where something is going to work and turn out to be a self-grounder, and that's a distinction. There's, in a creative reality, there's a difference between the grounding entity, the id quo, and the grounded entity, the id quad, but in God there's no distinction between them. I think the relationship is probably the same in both cases. In one case, God and his essence, we have a self-grounder, and in the other case, not. So all of this represents a pretty decent interpretation of what Boethius says. 
although it's not laid out so theoretically in Boethius. For example, Boethius main, maintains that God's substance is that by which God is God. That's in De Trinitate. Um, this is one of the key passages that Gilbert uses to support his own view. And uh, this is on the handout. Um, the, the capitalized words represent the, the, the lemmas from Boethius, which Gilbert's commenting on. When it's said that each of these, Plato, Cicero, Trypho, is a man, and each of those, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, is God, there is reference to substance. Not that which is, but that by which something is. That is to say, not to the subsistent, but to the subsistence. That's Gilbert's uh, um, comment there. And Boethius agrees that God is also to be identified with his essence. The divine substance is that which it is. Um, and that's no surprise. It's all from Augustine. The God's identified with his essence. And God's essence or substance is that by which God is. Um, but Gilbert follows Boethius very closely on, an, on another distinct piece of Trinitarian theology. Again, one deriving from a strictly philosophical issue, a reading of Aristotle's categories, the difference between relations and non-relational ac accidents. And again, this goes back to Augustine too. Gilbert claims that relational accidents are, quote, extrinsically affixed, right, extrinsicus affixe to their subjects, by which he means that they belong to their substance through the presence of something else, and that's a quote, and another quote, and minimally confer on the thing that it is something. They don't confer anything intrinsic to the thing at all, but just a reference to something else. And Gilbert gives some examples, being at a time or place, in contrast to being white, or acting, those are extrinsically affixed. He calls them circumstances of a thing. In these cases, what makes the relevant relational predications true uh, are substances distinct from the uh, subject of predication, my being in a place, for example, is just extrinsic to me, in the sense that the place I occupy is extrinsic to me. And this is Gilbert's getting this teaching from Boethius, uh, who says, you know, the last six Aristotelian categories attached to something extrinsically, attached something extrinsically to a subject, I'm sorry, in the sense that the relevant predications are grounded in other substances external to the related item. Gilbert has the relevant predications grounded in other substances such that what it is for something to be related to something else involves nothing intrinsic to the related item over and above the related item itself. What makes the, the item related to something else is simply the appropriate presence of the other thing. So the Father is, the Trinitarian application is this, uh, the Father is Father only with reference to there being a Son. And the Son is the Son only with reference to there being a Father. It doesn't com compromise the absolute simplicity of each person because being a father doesn't add anything intrinsic to the father. Right? It just involves a reference to the son. So I mention these two aspects of Gilbert's philosophically inflected theology because they were both issues on which he was criticized by Bernard. Uh, the controversy came to a head at the Council of, as I would say, Reims, I can't say Reims, it's too difficult, Reims, uh, in 1248. At Bernard's instigation, Gilbert was required by Pope Eugenius III to assent to the following creed and to bring his written work into conformity with it. And here is the creed, it's on the handout. We believe that the simple essence of divinity is God and that it cannot be denied in any orthodox way that divinity is God and God a divinity. And if it is said... The God is wise by wisdom, great by greatness, eternal by eternity, one by unity, God by divinity, and so on. We believe that he is wise only by that wisdom which is God himself, great only by that greatness which is God himself, eternal only by that eternity which is God himself, one only by that unity which is God himself, divine only by that divinity which is God himself. That is, that he in his own essence is wise, great, eternal, indivisible God. When we speak of three persons, right, second article, when we speak of three persons, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we understand them to be one God and one divine substance. And conversely, when we speak of one God or one divine substance, we profess uh, that one God and one divine substance are three persons. 
third article, we believe that only God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is eternal, that no things whatsoever, whether they are called relations or properties, singularities or unities, or anything of the kind, exist and have existed eternally in God unless they are God. And, fourthly, we believe that divinity, whether it's called divine substance or essence, is incarnate, but only in the Son. So we learn from John of Salisbury that Gilbert had no trouble assenting to this creed. And, you know, that shouldn't be a surprise. What's happening, uh, as I'll show in a moment, is that uh, Bernard has taken all of the... He's taken the philosophical understanding of the, of the quod est, quo est distinction, and he's treated Gilbert as though he's simply applying it to the divine case. But I've already shown that's not the case, that Gilbert uses the same notions, but he crucially identifies what, Gil, what, what Bernard thinks he's distinguishing... So, you know, Gilbert doesn't get condemned, um, for, uh, partly because that Bernard had annoyed the papal curia so much uh, that they would do almost anything to oppose him, um, and partly because he didn't deserve it. Right? He can assent to this creed with no trouble, and he was supposed to fix his book so they conformed to it. He didn't need to, because they already did conform to it. So Bernard learned nothing from this process. I think perhaps, while John of Salisbury hints, he suspected that Gilbert was guilty of some kind of duplicity. Um, and Bernard, Bernard can't let it go. Right? So there are two later works, De Consideratione and uh, Sermon 80 on the Song of Songs, where Bernard returns to Gilbert's teaching. And in both cases, what he worries is that Gilbert's item will commit him to a further item over and above God and ontologically prior or superior to God namely the divinity, the id quo. It's, it's brief discussion only in De Consideratione, but in the Sermon on the Song of Songs, he goes into some detail, and watching him at work is quite instructive. So what, at one point, Bernard tries to diagnose the cause of the theological problem. Uh, he says it's not logic, but novelty. Beware, he's to quote, beware of those who teach new doctrines who are not logicians, dialectici, but heretics. You know, but all of this is a bit ambiguous. Um, what, what, how should we understand not dialectic? Not, not a dialectician, not a logician. Uh, he might be saying, philosophy is wonderful and Gilbert's just a bad philosopher. I don't think he's saying that. He might be saying dialectic's not relevant to theological, theological issues. Or he might be saying, dialectic is bad enough, heresy, of course, is worse. Um, you can't quite tell what it is that he's worried about. I, I, I mention this because people think that in this passage, Bernard is sort of um, not unequivocally... They don't think he's condemning dialectic at all. I think uh, you just can't tell from this. And Bernard really is quite hostile. He's never particularly enthusiastic about philosophy, for example. In his most ex extensive discussion of the love of knowledge, Scientia, Bernard distinguishes five possible motivations simply for the sake of knowing, for the sake of being known, right? Vanity. For profit, to build up others, or to build up oneself. The first three of those are automatically shameful, motivated by curiosity, vanity, or financial gain. For the sake of building, of building up others and being built up oneself, he's neutral about that. But Bernard elsewhere links Scientia necessarily with vanity and self-glorification. And another, you know, elsewhere again, he contrasts the school of the Holy Spirit, quote, this is a quote, the school of the Holy Spirit, where you learn goodness, discipline, and scientia, with the quarrelsomeness of Plato and the cunning of Aristotle. Um, so what happens when Gilbert actually tries to discuss Bernard's uh, sorry, when Bernard tries to discuss Gilbert's theology in the sermon, um, just seems to reflect an inability to follow an argument on Bernard's part, and certainly to read a text with any great care. Um, Bernard highlights and comments on three objectionable passages. Um, the first is simply a misunderstanding of Gilbert's view. Quote, God, they say, is God by reason of his divinity, but the divinity is not God. Okay, so that's simply contrary to what Gilbert says. Second, 
case. It's on the handout. This is what Gilbert said, this is Bernard. The father is truth, that is, he's true. The son is, sorry, that is, he is true. The son is truth, that is, he is true. The Holy Spirit is truth, that is, he is true. And these, he, and these are not three truths, but one truth, that is, one being who is true. And Bernard comments, what an obscure and confused explanation. How much nearer the truth and how much more reasonable to have said, on the other hand, the father is true, that is, he is truth. The son is true, that is, he is truth. The Holy Spirit is true, that is, he is truth. And these things are not a uh, one being who is true. That is, they are one truth. So Ben has, in effect, flipped Gilbert's ordering. The father is truth, that is, he is true. That's Gilbert. Bernard, the father is true, that is, he is truth. So Bernard doesn't say why he thinks Gilbert's formulation is obscure and confused, or why his proposed formulation is, quote, nearer the truth and much more reasonable. But you can, it's easy enough to hazard a guess, to shift from A is truth, that is, A is true, Gilbert's formulation, to A is true, that is, A is truth. Uh, well, I think we're so, Bernard's thinking we're supposed to claw, understand the clause after the that is as providing the explanation or ground for the clause before the that is. So, in Bernard's understanding, each person's identity with truth is what explains that person's being true. Just as each person's identity with the divinity is what explains that person's being divine. And this implication presumably is lacking in Gilbert's formulation, and that's what Bernard doesn't like. But really, what's going on here is that Bernard hasn't, he either hasn't read the text very carefully, Gilbert's text, or he hasn't followed it. Um, to see why, we need to begin by looking at Boethius's text. Boethius' basic argument is that some predicates in God are common to the three persons, and some proper to just one. We can discern which predicates are common by noting whether or not the term can be predicated of the, of the three persons together, right? Severally of each of the three collected together. Thus, this is Boethius, if we say the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God, then Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one God. If then their deity is one substance, the name of God may with right be predicated substantially of the divinity. And another example, Boethius, similarly the Father is truth, the Son is truth, the Holy, the Holy Spirit is truth. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are not three truths, but there is one truth. So here's how Gilbert's text, the one that Bernard quoted, looks with the lemmas from Boethius highlighted in block capitals. The Father is truth, that is true. Again, the Son is truth, that is true. Again, the Holy Spirit is truth, that is true. And together, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are not three truths, but they are one truth. So they are one truth, singularly and simply speaking. That is one being who is true. But because of the singularity of the predicate truth, he, Boethius says in the singular, is. Right? And that, the highlighted bit, gets you the entire Boethian passage. Well, okay, so the two cases that Boethius considers, God and truth, are not in fact comparable, if you go to the two previous um, texts on the handout from Boethius. The one predicate is concrete, God, the other is abstract, truth. So what Gilbert's commentary does is he corrects the second case to make it conform to the first, and that seems to be the right thing to do. The first case is the paradigm, right? Uh, the Father is God. Right? Consists of a pre-theoretical formulation, three persons, one God. Bringing in the identity of God and the three divine persons with abstracta requires further theoretical work. So Gilbert does this, and he, write, he clearly indicates that he would be happy with the reasons for Bernard's formulation too. It's because the three persons are, quote, one by singularity of essence, that they are one God. Okay, Bernard claims that Augustine prefers his formulation, and Boethius is over Gilbert's. As he puts it, according to Augustine, it's more properly and appropriately said, God is greatness, goodness, justice, wisdom, than God is great, good, just, or wise. Um, well, you can get something like that um, out of Augustine, um, but I mean, the point is that Bernard hasn't paid any attention to the, the commentary context and the, kind, and the argument that Gilbert's trying to develop. There's an even more striking case, the third case in um, the Sermon on the Song of Songs. 
This is from Bernard again. Remember, Boethius said, God, God, God refers to substance. This commentator of ours, Gilbert, adds, not what the substance is, but that by which it is. God forbid that the church should give assent to the proposition that there is any substance or anything but which God is what he is, but which is not God. As, as um, Gilbert's editor, Nicholas Herring, has shown, the claim that Bernard finds so objectionable and that he ascribes to Gilbert, right, right, God refers to the substance by which God is, is just a quotation from Boethius. And the first bit, God, God, God refers to the substance, comes from Gilbert. So he's inverted Boethius and Gilbert. And you can find the claim in Augustine too, that God is, as it were, by his essence. So really, not only is Bernard not very good at uh, following an argument, uh, he doesn't even seem to know the texts of Boethius and Augustine, which is surprising. I mean, Bernard's very cagey about who his authorities are. Um, and his, his, most of his writings um, as the con have the Bible as the, the source that they constantly quote every other sentence is a, a sort of scriptural verse. But, you know, the editors, Father Leclerc uh, and his assistant, um, diligently note patristic and um, um, classical allusions when they find them. Um, and uh, they found only one case where Bernard alluded to, to Augustine's De Trinitate. Um, <clears throat> The next passage on the handout is um, just Bernard's own view. I'm not going to worry about that. Um, it's hard not to be sympathetic to a comment of Peter Abelard's in the Apologia contra Bernardum. And it just seems highly apropos. Although I said that the wisdom of God is a certain... Well, forget that. Um, that's just talking about the um, controversy. Um, and Bernard's misunderstood him. You are manifestly mistaken, as if in no way comprehending the import of the words, and as if you did not have a share of that teaching which is the mistress of debate, and which not only teaches to understand words, but is able to discuss them once they've been understood. Right? That's dialectic. So know what you did not know, and learn what you have not learned. Because the wisdom of God... And then he goes on to... Uh, ex explain why Bernard has misunder misunderstood his Abelard's teaching. And then at the end he has a little a bit of advice. For indeed it often happens that some words, when taken on their own, may be entirely of a given meaning, yet when placed in a construction and joined with the words of the construction, they change meaning, so that this sense of the construction may be true, but that one false. Okay, this is a very elementary point that Abelard is trying to teach uh, to Bernard. Um, so, I mean, my topic turns out in a way to be rather disappointing because it's not clear that philosophy really played any substantive role in Bernard's criticism of Abelard, uh, 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 of, of Gilbert, um, it, other than some general allergy to anything philosophical, by which I mean um, natural philosophy, physics, mathematics on the one hand, and dialectic on the other, just some natural instinctive antipathy to this way of proceeding. There is a, certainly a story of Bernard um, arriving at one of the schools and observing a disputation uh, and being so horrified he just ran out of the room. So John of Salisbury, this is my last little point, John of Salisbury provides some very salient commentary on the controversy at Reims. So he discusses some of the person, he gives us quite a detailed description and discusses some of the personnel with you know, his own little descriptions. Sujet, Sujet of Saint-Denis. It says, literatus et eloquens, learned and eloquent. Gilbert, literatissimus. Bernard, eloquentissimus, but who scarcely knew secular learning. So Suchet has some skills, whatever this is, uh, literatus et eloquens, to some degree. Gilbert has one to an extreme degree, literatissimus, and Bernard the other, eloquentissimus. So Bernard was a really beautiful Latin writer. Uh, 
But what is it, what's the learning that Gilbert has and that Bernard lacks according to John of Salisbury? It's a bit puzzling on the face of it because eloquentia is often a way of just referring to the study of the trivium, and so you'd think uh, um, that eloquentia and uh, literatus would be synonymous. Eloquence and literatus would be synonymous. But Bernard can't mean that, John can't mean that Bernard lacks knowledge of classical literature because Bernard was clearly well, well read in Latin of the Golden and Silver Ages, Terence, Cicero, Virgil, Horace, Tubulus, Ovid, Seneca, Perseus, Statius, and Juvenal, all according to Father Leclerc, he alludes to or quotes. So I presume what's lacking is the knowledge of dialectic. Um, John reports a wonderful snippet of what happened afterwards. And obviously, Bernard and Gilbert were both still furious with each other. John says this, I recall that I myself, on behalf of the abbot, entreated the bishop to meet him in some religious house in Poitou or France or Burgundy, wherever he preferred, to discuss the writings of the blessed Hilary amicably and without rancor. He, however, replied, Gilbert, however, replied that they had already disputed sufficiently on the matter, and if the abbot wished to reach a full understanding of Hilary, he should first seek further instruction in the liberal arts and other preliminary studies. Um, I've given you my conclusion already, uh, which is that it's just hard to get beyond the impression that Bernard had some deep, profound antipathy to the thought that dialectic and, the nat and natural philosophy could offer anything to theology. Um, but his opponents, I fear, were very quick to point out what they thought to be his simple ignorance of the matter. Thank you.